All right, all right, all right. Well, welcome back to a brand new episode. My name is Casey, and this podcast is called Good News for Those Who Struggle. We are so glad that you have joined us today. You guys are in for a treat. We have with us uh, someone who is very special. Her name is Marty Wibbles. I'm going to let her introduce herself, but I do want you to know just an immediate connection um, to our church. Uh, Marty and I go back to uh, Spanish River Church days uh, years ago, but um, more recently, uh, Marty is uh, the author of one of the groups uh, that we are hosting right now at our church called Core Healing from Trauma. This group uh, filled up fast and um, was just, there was a, a big hunger for this. And we've looked at some of this core healing before on a previous episode with Amanda Devlin. And we are, um, we were blessed then, and uh, we are definitely blessed to have Marty with us as uh, the author and founder here. And so, Marty, would you please give us the honor of giving us an introduction um, to yourself, maybe a little bit about you, your family, and, and uh, what you do? Thank you, Casey. It's great to be with you all. Well, first of all, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. I came to know him when I was 15. I'm Alan's wife, Alan Wibbles, and together we've served in ministry in various places. He served as a youth pastor. Together we were missionaries. And it was during the years we were in Colorado Springs on the staff of a PCA church, Uh, I was teaching a women's study on understanding your emotions. I Mm. thought I did. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) I really thought I did. I was in my late 20s. And um, at the end of that course, a really sharp professional woman came up to me and she said, Marty, I heard people say this was a good course. That was a bad sign right there because she was in the course. Uh And she said, I heard people say it was Uh good. Uh It was a large group. And I said, yes. She said, I have to tell you, I got nothing out of it. Oh, wow. And I went, oh, okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. And um, I said, would it help you if we met one-to-one? And she said, yeah, it might. And we started meeting one-to-one, and she said, Marty, you got to understand something. God could not love me. Mm. There are things I have done, and there is no way he could love me. Mm. And so I just steadily, slowly carefully began showing her throughout the Old and New Testament how God could love her, how he does love her, how he did everything needed for her salvation. And she said, no, he couldn't love me. And I knew nothing about what I was about to say, but I asked her, and you know how sometimes the Holy Spirit leads you to say things? Well, he did. I said, when did you have your abortion? And it was like I had hit her with a thunderbolt, wow. lightning bolt, whatever you want to call it. And she said, how did you know? And I said, well, I think God let me know because you need to know that he loves you. And as we work through... Um, just her understanding that mm-hmm. Jesus came for her, Jesus paid for sin, mm-hmm. and offered her new life. She invited Christ in her life. And I, I need to tell you this part of the story of core healing from trauma, because mm-hmm. there would be no core healing for, from trauma if we hadn't continued meeting. She started, as soon as she had the great joy of knowing Christ had paid for her sins and accepting him as her Savior and feeling free for the first time in her life, she started having horrible nightmares. Mm. She couldn't sleep, repressed memories. And what that means is things that are too awful to bring to conscious um, thought started coming out of her subconscious. And she was remembering that her brother had molested her from the time she was a little girl. And I said, you need to go see a professional counselor. I wasn't one Mm -hmm. yet. I am now, but Mm -hmm. I wasn't yet. And she said, no, 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 no. I could not do that. It would destroy my husband's career to have a wife having counseling. Things were different in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully now people don't see it as a stigma to Mm -hmm. see a counselor because, frankly, we all need help Mm -hmm. sometimes, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Um, So anyway, core healing was birthed really, as I met with her week after week. And there weren't books in the late 70s like Core Mm -hmm. Healing. Mm -hmm. Um, There weren't um, 
great things to take people through. So I just dug into scripture since she wouldn't go see a counselor. Mm. And you know what I found? Mm. God gives us everything we need yes. for life and godliness. Yes. And she really experienced peace and healing. And when we were moving away from Colorado Springs, she pointed her finger at me and said, Marty, promise me you will write something to help other people like you helped me. And naively, I promised her. Mm. And then I did nothing because I was terrified because like, what sure. do I know? And I tried to tell mm. her I shouldn't write something because I, I said, if, if you were helped at all by me, it wasn't I, it was the Lord because mm-hmm. I know nothing. And she said, mm. no, you helped me, you mm. write something. So first of all, I wrote two novels about sexual abuse. I wrote one and it took me, count them, 20 years. Wow. I was very adept at procrastinating. (laughs) And my husband kept saying, Marty, you promised her that you would write something. I said, yeah, yeah, I did, didn't I? But you know what? God's going to provide a psychologist who knows more about this than Mm. I do. I don't know enough. And he went, well, honey, you made the promise. Yeah. (laughs) You made the promise. He said, I don't care if no one reads it, but our three daughters, and you asked me to tell something about myself. I have three daughters, Mm -hmm. and I have grandchildren, and now great grandchildren it's wow, such a joy congrats yeah so anyway um eventually i wrote a novel and by the time it came out i was in graduate school becoming a real counselor mm. and um and then when i was a counselor um working in in boca at spanish river people kept saying to me why are your clients getting better and I'm like, I don't know. And I remember one day explaining to a client um, who had been severely uh, traumatized. Mm. I, I said, trauma like that impacts the core of your being. And she was nodding her head, yes, like I do in the doctor's office when I have no clue what mm. the doctor's talking right, about. Right, right, right. And I said, do you know what I mean when I say core of your being? She said, I don't have a clue. And I, I thought, okay, I need to explain this more clearly. And the next morning when I met with the Lord, as I do every morning, um, just to study the word and pray and Mm. fall more in love with Jesus, I just said, Jesus, could you help me do a better job of explaining the core of the being, of Mm. the one's being? And I just started on a piece of scratch paper writing out words that I associated with the core of someone's being, like competence, safety, identity, Mm purpose, belonging. And I saw a pattern emerge. If you take the first three, C-S-I, that's easy to remember, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. the the show, crime, scene, investigation. And a lot of trauma is a crime, not all, but Mm -hmm. certainly some. And then the last part, P-B, plan B. It doesn't help us to stay at the scene of trauma investigating it. Mm. Um, We need to move to plan B. So that's the five core areas that we work on healing a person's sense of competence, which is eroded in varying degrees by trauma, Um, safety. And people don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. Like if they've been through a major um, relational difficulty such as divorce or a betrayal by a friend Mm -hmm. or a tsunami. It feels like an emotional tsunami. Those things do. Um, So reestablishing a sense of safety and then identity. Who am I anyway? And then purpose. Mm. I was talking with a woman today, in fact, who said, I'm finally realizing I have a purpose. Mm. And that was a woman who had been molested by, um, 20 some people mm. trafficked by her oh my goodness. a family member and um it's taken a long time but she's seeing she has a purpose and belonging is the fifth core mm. area that's eroded and so are you thank you for for that marty i'm just going to jump right in good um, on, on some i kind of did didn't no I? that was great it was, <laughs> it was awesome let's just get, get after it <laughs> i right, love it i love right. it marty are those um you identified those those areas are you saying that those are some of the areas that either get compromised or attacked uh, as it pertains to like trauma when it happens to somebody? Yes, absolutely. And and what happens then, people don't go, oh, my sense of competence has been eroded mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. I don't feel safe. They instead become what we call numb survivors. Okay. 
where they try to numb out the pain, and it might be through substances, Mm -hmm. or it might be through activities. Mm. Some of the most active people in churches have experienced trauma, and they don't want to feel it. They don't want to acknowledge it. They don't want to heal from it. In fact, during that same time period in the 1970s, when I was, you know, helping people understand their emotions Mm -hmm. that I thought I did, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, there was a speaker in Colorado Springs, and she was written up in the paper. We used to have those, you know? Yeah, I remember. (laughs) And um, her name is Claudia Black, and she said, there are three rules in an alcoholic home. I grew up in one of those. And she she said, they are don't talk, Mm -hmm. don't trust, don't feel. Mm -hmm. And what we call those in psychology is meta rules. Okay. They're much more powerful than the rules that are written down, like make your bed, Mm -hmm. load your dishes Mm -hmm. in the dishwasher. But people who grow up in an addict's home don't talk about it. They don't trust people Mm -hmm. and they don't feel. And so we need to heal from those things too. It's a lot of different things that are wrapped up in core healing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so would you give me those those main areas again, please? What, what were they again? The five core yes, areas please. are competence, mm-hmm. safety, mm-hmm. identity, mm-hmm. purpose, mm-hmm. and belonging. Okay, so Marty, how would someone potentially um, start to have some maybe yellow or even red flags and realize, hey, this is a damaged area in me? Well... Okay, a damaged area in the sense of competence. If if you walk into a room and just feel like, I don't matter. Mm-hmm. I don't have anything to offer mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. My life is so much more messed up than anybody else's. Mm-hmm. Um, I can never succeed. What's wrong with me? Mm. Those kind of thoughts. Okay. And they're cleverly camouflaged. A lot of times we don't bring them to the surface because only 20% of our thinking is in the conscious area. Okay. 80% is in our subconscious mind. Hmm. So as you work through core healing, it helps you bring those automatic negative thoughts that are stuffed into your subconscious that you're thinking, that you don't even realize you're thinking, um, to the surface. Hmm. So is it fair to say that in each of those five areas, you might have some of those same defeater thoughts or whatever you might Absolutely. call them? Absolutely. We call them cognitive distortions. Okay. And cognitive is thoughts and uh, distortions in our mind are kind of like um, walking into a carnival's hall of mirrors and one makes you look 10 feet tall hey i'm five foot one i think that'd be pretty fun Mm -hmm. 10 feet tall Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. um so that would be um a cognitive distortion we might think i should do better i i'm always um a failure so I just gave you two types of cognitive distortions, should thinking, mm-hmm. I should do better. Okay. And that's the emotional equivalent of having a whip, whipping mm. yourself. Mm. Like if you've ever watched the worshipers at Mecca, the Muslim worshipers mm. with their little whips, they're whipping their back mm. and blood is spurting down their back. That's essentially what we're doing to ourselves emotionally when we use should thinking. Okay. It's okay. like a whip. Yeah. Um, anyway. So then, so then these are areas that um, if we begin to be a bit more mindful and pay attention to, we, we can probably um, begin to see, hey, there, there's some, there's some, um, some problem here. There, there's, there's an area that's, mm-hmm. that's not functioning the way it was meant to function. And, mm-hmm. and then, so core healing begins to address those. And, and from what we were talking about prior, is very solution-oriented. Yes. Correct? Talk mm-hmm. to me a little bit about that solution-oriented approach. Okay, well... You know, our God is a God of hope. He's, mm. In fact, he's the God of all hope. Mm. So why would we focus on hopeless things? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, actually, we jumped ahead. I, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead You're to just, chapter two. Uh-huh. It, the title of that chapter is Don't Believe Everything You Think. Yes. And it spells out the 10 types of distorted thinkings. Um, chapter one, though, to go back to your question about solution focus, mm-hmm really helps you get to where you need to go to start healing. Okay. Um, It's living after trauma. So whether the trauma is relational or whether it's abuse, Mm -hmm. it could be any kind of abuse, emotional, physical, sexual, um, and so on. Or if it's having survived a terrible storm or other kind of loss, how about COVID? Mm-hmm. I, I think that qualifies for all of us. Mm-hmm. So 
chapter one teaches us solution for oriented ways how to manage trauma. Mm -hmm. Trauma is stored in the brain's amygdala. Have okay. you heard of that? Yes. Okay, yes. yeah. Um, and the amygdala is really good. We need the shot of adrenaline we sure. get when our amygdala is activated for fight or flight. Right. But it's not really good when it's overactivated by trauma memories. Okay. It only takes a twelfth of a second or less for trauma stored in the brain's amygdala. And we have two amygdalae, mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. in each hemisphere of the brain. Twelfth of a second for that trauma to literally hijack mm -hmm. the prefrontal cortex, where we both are now. I can tell by your eyes, Casey, you're thinking. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think mm -hmm. and answer your questions. But I, I have to confess, I have a problem doing something like this because I've researched this topic for over 30 years. Okay. So, you know, to try to condense it, right. I, it's like I'm, I'm trying to bring it in, bring it you're in. You're doing great. I'm oh, with you. Oh, thank and you. I think thank our you. listeners are with you. Oh, thank you, listeners, and thank you, Casey. Um, so anyway, what we learn in Chapter 1 is how to recognize when we have an amygdala hijacking because trauma survivors do. And I do a skit when I do workshops that shows my take on how Satan manipulates us with trauma mm. because he knows how God made us. Right. He sees the amygdala. And so I do this kind of scary skit where I go in, I put a scarf on mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I don't want to say I am Satan, but mm -hmm. I'm acting like sure. Satan there. Yeah. And he, um, after the fall and after God promises a Messiah in Genesis three, mm -hmm. right. Um, then people are, going to God in prayer, and Satan calls the demon, again, this is hypothetical, mm -hmm. I'm making this up, mm -hmm. but after counseling about 3,000 trauma survivors, I think it, it um, is real, yeah. um, because it's just much more likely for someone to say, why did God do this to me, mm -hmm. than why did Satan do this, mm -hmm. and God mm -hmm. would never do the mm -hmm. evil stuff that happens to people, because mm -hmm. God is good. Right. So anyway, um, my hypothesis is... John 10, 10, which is no hypothesis, mm. it's truth, and truth sets you free. But John 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief, Satan, yeah. comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus, am come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Mm. Oh, I hope you're hearing this, dear mm. listeners, because God wants you to have abundant life. But okay, the traumas in your brain, 12th of a second, Satan knows he can work you like a marionette. Mm. So here's what I think happened. Yeah my theory. Um, he got all these demons together and said, look, it's not working. Mm. We got them to rebel against God. And now they have a problem and they say, oh God, help us. And he does. We've got to stop this. So he sends mm. the demons out to figure a way to get people back under their thumbs. Wow. <laughs> Isn't this scary? Yeah. It's really a horrible skit to do. I tried to get a worship director to do it for me. Instead, he went, no. Sounds uh, very <laughs> screw tape letter. letter yeah, issue, yeah right? I think that's yeah. where I got the yeah. idea. So anyway, the demons all come back and one goes, oh, Lucifer, I have a great idea. And he goes, impress me. And, and so this demon says, well, we take the parts God gave men and women to have in marriage, you know, where those extra nerve endings are, and we give them messages that completely confuse them. We have people who should be loving them and caring for them hurt them there. And then any time we want to mess with them, we just remind them of that, mm. etc. Mm. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. any trauma is like that. So a twelfth of a second, just picture these marionette strings yanking you around. Right. Whoops, right. I just smashed my hand. Sorry about that. Um, but why we need to know this, because if we don't know how to manage the trauma stored in our amygdala, we're just ambushed yeah. over and over. Yeah. So can you see how easily addictions happen? Absolutely. You know, like I can't feel this pain. And it just like my dear friend that got me started on this journey in the 1970s, she had successfully, and put that in quotes mm -hmm. because it wasn't successful, mm -hmm. but she had repressed the memory so much that she was absolutely stunned to remember her brother sexually molesting her. Wow. It was so repressed. And, and in a way, it's a helpful function for a while at least because there's nowhere in our rational mind where we can go, yeah, it makes total sense for a family member mm -hmm. to molest. And mm -hmm. No, it never makes sense. It's never good. Mm -hmm. And the question I get most often is why did God 
let this happen. Mm. It's like Eli Wiesel, the lately Eli Wiesel, the uh, Jewish Holocaust survivor who Mm -hmm. wrote Night, said people often ask him to explain the meaning for the Holocaust. Mm. He said, there's there's no way you can Mm -hmm. explain the rationale or the meaning of the Holocaust. But what we do, and this is the solution focus, we help people see how to move beyond it, Mm -hmm. beyond unthinkable, Mm -hmm. horrific pain that God never designed people Mm -hmm. to bear. Mm -hmm. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest for your soul. So we learn how to manage the trauma as soon as it hits. And that's the exciting thing. I love seeing this happen because, okay, instead of living in an amygdala hijacking, and you might ask, how do you identify when Mm -hmm. you have an amygdala Mm -hmm. hijacking? If the five F's are present, and that's fight, flight, freeze, you'd numb it out, Mm -hmm. fornicate, Mm -hmm. and that can be acting out sexually, but it also can be um, women can get into reading torrid romance novels Mm -hmm. or or acting out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth or the fifth one is feed. So fight, flight, freeze, fornicate, or feed. Mm -hmm. And that's eating disorders, um, are fed by that. Right. Um, people don't eat or, sure. or they eat a lot. Sure. Or so Marty, here's, here's kind of what I hear you saying. Th- core healing, especially as it's beginning here, we're talking about chapter one and, and then, you know, probably maybe even a little bit in chapter two, th- these, these function as real user friendly tools that help bring us back to to Jesus, who yes. then brings that renewal yes. that we need. Am yeah. I am I tracking exactly? Like okay. Lamentations three, this is after Jeremiah has like said everything's bad. I'm paraphrasing. Mm-hmm. Everything's mm-hmm. bad. Life is hard, um, and then he goes, "Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope." Verse twenty one. The mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, and my soul knows it full well. Mm -hmm. So core healing is helping us see realistically Mm -hmm. how to experience God's faithfulness. It is not a saccharine solution. Mm -hmm. It's hard hitting. We deal with the realities of life, and I think we need to. Mm -hmm. Um, Life is a struggle. Jesus said in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good courage. I have overcome the world. So it's helping us live life overcomers. So if we notice the five Fs, fight, fight, freeze, fornicate, or feed in our life, or if we notice that we're feeling really anxious, Mm -hmm. and that could be like heart palpitations, headaches, tingling Mm -hmm. fingers, Mm -hmm. difficulty breathing, or depressed. And Mm -hmm. chapter two, which is don't believe everything you think, um, that deals with that in great detail. And the reason I started with these two chapters, the first one helping you manage an amygdala hijacking, Mm -hmm. and the second one helping you manage your mind, is because you're not going to be able to heal in the core if you don't have those things down. That's so good. Because so... um, just my experience. So I am a little bit into chapter two. Okay. And part, part of this is a, a question that I want you to speak into a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily um, thinking of myself as a trauma survivor. Mm-hmm. So when I hear core healing, trauma, that's, that's not necessarily a lane that I've thought would be helpful to me. Mm-hmm. So now I start doing the work and it's very helpful to me uh-huh. so and and just even in what you're saying it's almost like at times uh, if i can explain it like this you're caught in a snowstorm that turns into a blizzard and core healing gives you tools to hold on to and pull you into that refuge so mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about who is core healing for who does it bless Human beings, mm. because frankly, we all experience okay. trauma. Okay, I, and I think that probably is the thing that most needs to be understood. Yeah, because like when I was teaching it at our church, um, just as COVID hit, we changed the title of the class I was teaching to "Strengthening Your Core." Okay, because several people stopped me and said, "I'd really like to come to your class, but I feel kind of weird, yeah. like I'd be singling myself out to say." Mm-hmm. Ooh, I've survived some mm-hmm. terrible trauma. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, well, what? A, and one of the women actually came up with the title, Strengthen Your Core. Yeah, yeah. who doesn't want to be You're strong? You're right, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, maybe it's just getting past that. Um, but so, I mean, in your understanding, we, we all experience trauma. Like, we mm-hmm. all have some p- 
potential um, things that are eroding those five core areas. Is right. that fair? Is that absolutely? Fair and it's not that all five areas are impacted. Mm -hmm. It may be only, only put mm -hmm. that in quotes, mm -hmm. only a person's sense of competence. Right. You know, like a man who's out of work right. may feel like, "What's wrong with me? I can't get another job." Right. Or a woman who's out of work too may feel the same way. Or someone whose friend rejected or won't mm. return texts mm -hmm. um, may feel like. I must be a defective human being. So yeah. it's, and really if after um, over 50 years serving in various ministry capacities, I, I believe that these are key areas we all need to be mature as Christians. Mm. And that's just even, even helpful to understand that trauma can take um, different forms, shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. And um, that, th that word should be more invitational than exclusionary is what I'm finding. Oh, I like that. More invitational than exclusionary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a believer. I'm, I'm in, and, and <laughs> the, and what got, you know, just, just kind of even once the tools start being applied and you start doing the work, um, I think that, you know, we label labels are, are secondary to the fact that this, this works, this helps, this begins to bring you into some, some healing in some places that I feel like, like you said, God's inviting us into this abundant life in Christ. Yes. These are tools that help mm -hmm. us get there. And Webster's defines trauma as a physical wound or injury, a violent emotional blow. I think we all can mm -hmm. relate with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, Marty, we, we spoke a little bit about, um, I, th I think if, if in, the, in the book, if, if you were to look at page 67, um, idea of victim, rescuer, persecutor. Can you talk to us a little bit about this key concept and then and then take us further sure um that is in the chapter titled i am a victor and one thing that happens in life is sometimes we feel like victims mm. victims of maybe someone starts a gossip campaign against us or victims of not getting picked for the worship team mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. something like that and three unhealthy emotional roles to take whenever we're disappointed. And you probably heard the saying, our disappointments are God's appointments. But right. when we're really disappointed, we really don't want to hear that. Right. right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we don't want, save that for, for we later. Don't right? want yeah. Cliches. Yeah. yeah. So what do we do aggressively to deal with the heartaches and hangups and disappointments of life? unhealthy ways are known as the victim game or the Karpman triangle. Mm -hmm. And because it was developed by a doctor whose last name ironically was Karpman. Hey, and um, the three unhealthy roles that you do not want to live in are victim, mm -hmm. rescuer, mm -hmm. or persecutor. Okay. And in this game, the goal of the victim is to be the victim. Okay. As our mentor, Dr. Henry Brandt once said, most people don't want to be helped. They only want to be heard. Wow. So um, that is something to bear in mind. Can I just stop you there? And How do you know if you actually want to be helped or you just want to be heard? Oh, you know you want to be helped if you're willing to do the work. Okay. Yeah, it takes work. That's very so, clear. So if someone says, you know, this would help you, and you mm -hmm. go, no, but, and if, if we mm. say but, that's a verbal eraser of okay. whatever we were just told. Oh, that's powerful. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's a great answer. Okay. Okay. So the victim has had a true heartache or true difficulty. Maybe she's going through a divorce or maybe he has been rejected by the love of his life, or maybe, um, there has been childhood abuse, something mm -hmm. that qualifies him or her as a victim. Mm -hmm. What the victim does is find some, someone who who will reinforce that notion. Okay. You poor thing. Oh, mm -hmm. that's so hard. Let mm -hmm. me help you. Mm -hmm. And that would be a rescuer. Mm -hmm. And we look through our churches and organizations, and there's lots of rescuers. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that go, I'll save you. Right. I'll make it better. Yeah. Let me bring you food. And it's not that we don't bring food. It's not that we don't help people, but we need to be careful. We don't do things that they can do for themselves. Okay. So the rescuer gets his or her feelings of well-being by rescuing mm. the poor victim mm -hmm. you poor mm -hmm. thing but the victim who doesn't want to be helped and and again th this is not verbalized these things aren't yeah, talked right, about right. they're just 
um, subconscious roles people take, but they're powerful roles, mm-hmm. let me tell you. Um, the victim is going to flip the rescuer into a persecutor because the rescuer is eroding mm. the preferred position in life. Mm. And so then the rescuer feels like, oh, I did all that for nothing. Mm-hmm. I got no appreciation. Mm-hmm. Oh. And so then the rescuer feels like a victim, and the roles flip all the time. Uh, okay. Okay. Victim goes to rescuer, to persecutor, and so on. So, Marty, let me ask you this. How do you know when you're being a rescuer? Um, if you're getting your feelings of well-being mm. because you're doing these heroic things for people, mm-hmm. or if you don't feel appreciated okay. enough. Okay. You know, we're called to be servants of Christ, mm-hmm. and a servant doesn't get a banner <laughs> or a blue ribbon. Right, Good right, job. A, right. a servant... Gets well done, thou good and faithful servant. Okay, okay. At the end, but okay. All right. So now Mar- Marty's gonna gonna flip this and and I think tell tell us take us to the sort of the redeemed model of this. But I want to listener, I want you to understand this is huge for us to to link into because this triangle um, is it's happening in churches all over. It's happening mm-hmm. with well intentioned people who love Jesus and love people, but can can quickly be caught in this it could be happening in your family your small group your the the wh- whatever community you might find yourself in so just just cluing you in on the fact that like this is this is big and significant so marty take us take us to a better version of this okay. if you will and and i i want to be honest and admit i was in that victim game when we were in student ministry i definitely was a rescuer i mm-hmm. thought i could help everybody all mm-hmm. the time mm-hmm. and there came a point where my husband and i looked at each other and said We're in meetings every night, and we've got three precious daughters. Mm. We need to quit rescuing everybody else's kids and focus on our own kids. Um, So we did that. Mm. But I I didn't know. (laughs) Thank you for making that boundary for Uh, uh, the the next generation that comes up and gets to see that family first matters and mm, is a real thing. Yeah, God is faithful. So, you know... I'm not trying to say, hey, I've arrived and you haven't. We all are on a journey. And the wonderful thing is the good shepherd is the one who's leading us. Mm. We were in Scotland a few years ago, and I love sheep. I Mm -hmm. so love Mm -hmm. sheep because Mm -hmm. Jesus is our good shepherd. And so I, I tried to walk close to where the sheep were safely fenced and I could get only so close and then they were terrified and Mm. they walked away. But what I noticed, um, what's, they weren't helping each other. Hmm. They were each for his own okay. or her own. Wow. And I thought they are a hundred percent dependent on the shepherd. And yeah. so are we, yeah. we think we're so hot, but we're not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we need the good shepherd. Right. And he laid down his life for us. So he gave us everything we need, but here's a paradigm to mm-hmm. get us to a safer place. Okay. And again, picture with me a triangle. The other one, the Carpman triangle had the three roles, victim, rescuer and persecutor Mm -hmm. this triangle is the power of choice Mm -hmm. we always have a choice Mm -hmm. every day 100 percent. we have a choice Mm -hmm. we can choose a good attitude or a bad attitude Mm -hmm. Um, but in this one instead of the victim at the top of the triangle you have a creator and that notion or idea is based on genesis where god said to adam and eve rule over the earth and subdue it that's known as the dominion mandate Mm -hmm. and we each have a domain to manage and it's exciting to think about um instead of thinking well i haven't done anything important think of what mother Teresa said no one can do great things only small things with great love mm. so as a creator mm-hmm. you can do small things with mm. great love right now mm. today you don't have to wait mm. till some epiphany hits mm-hmm. do mm-hmm. it today where you are um and then the next role instead of being a rescuer be a coach the coach doesn't play the game for the team mm. the coach coaches Mm -hmm. the team and says, hey, you can do it. Try this. Do that. Mm -hmm. And then the third role in the power of choice is challenger. So instead of going, oh, everybody's out to get me, um, we say, wow, this is a challenging situation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can see one triangle that's very healthy and and helpful and another one that's um, destructive. How, How do you move from if you are a rescuer and that's you know, let's just say that's a bit of your, if, if, I, if I can say this, natural bent or propensity. How do you move from rescuer to coach? 
you shift gears. Okay. It's just like, I love driving a five speed and I love, you know, that little sound yeah. where, you know, you've got to step on the clutch and mm-hmm. shift gears. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you just step on the clutch and shift gears. Just okay. do it. Okay. Don't wait. It's not a process. You know, I love it when people say, well, I need to process that. And I, I ask what <laughs> specifically do you need to process? Right. Right. So with this, just do it. It's, it's like the other day I woke up and I was... I had what Zig Ziglar used to call stinking thinking. Uh-huh. I was totally a victim because I blew my knee and I am in so much mm. pain. My husband had to help me in here this evening. I'm, I'm just in a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. And so I was like thinking, this is so hard. And I said to the Lord, you know how much I have to do. Mm-hmm. Victim, victim, mm-hmm. victim. Mm-hmm. I had my little invisible violin out. And the Lord spoke to me and said, trust me rejoice in me. Mm. And so I did the shift. Yeah. I shifted from victim to creator. Just and right I said, there. Just right there. Yeah, okay. exactly. Before I got out of bed, it hurt a lot to get out of bed. So mm-hmm. this took a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But, but it was, it totally changed my day. Wow. And I got everything done I needed to do. There were some things I didn't need to do because I mm-hmm. didn't have the strength to do them. Mm-hmm. And by trusting God as my good shepherd and not trying to mm-hmm. barrel through on my own, it worked. So that, um, it, it prompts me to ask you a question about something that I haven't got, gotten to in the book yet, okay. but I see the image that you, you put there and, I, and I'm wondering if you can explain it a little bit because I think these shifts are really helpful for us and doable. Like mm-hmm. the, we don't need years of, like you said, processing. You, mm-hmm. We can shift, especially by the power of the spirit. We can make mm-hmm. that shift. Yeah. And, and the image um, that it looks like I'm coming closer and closer to is this this idea of verse. Um, I think it's like gaze. Oh, help me, help me with that you're gaze talking verse. Talking about my best friend Gigi. Come on, help yeah. me with this. Oh, Gigi is on page thirty-one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm almost there. So let's let's, let's go. I there. just have to give a, a shout out to my wonderful artist um, Monica O'Connor. She, I, I met her in West Palm and told her my concept for this book mm-hmm. that I wanted it to be relevant to all ages mm-hmm. and races and mm-hmm. et cetera. And I, I was so excited because, you know, when you've worked yeah. on something a long time and then I thought, she's going to think I am crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she looked at me and said, hey, I'm a Christian too and I get it. Oh, and wow. and so she did the graphic design and I call this girl Gigi okay. because it stands for glance and gaze. So okay. it's a picture of a woman mm-hmm. and she's kind of looking up. But we base the glance gaze theory on Matthew six thirty three and thirty four. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. What things? Everything you need. Mm. Everything mm. Um, as well. Therefore, oh, this is so key. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, mm-hmm. for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Mm. So the principle is this. We have problems and needs. Mm -hmm. Jesus told us Mm -hmm. we would. So we glance at those, Mm -hmm. and then we gaze at God. Mm. So we're not like going, no, 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 this isn't that bad. Yeah, it is bad. Mm -hmm. Stuff can be bad. Um, Our life can be disrupted. But we're going to acknowledge the need and then gaze at God. Mm -hmm. And is is this something that you find needs to be repeated like throughout the day, do we mm-hmm. do we have a propensity? You think at times to come back to the to the glance and and then need yeah. to go back to the gaze. Yeah, well, Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful and mm. desperately wicked. Mm-hmm. Who can know it? I mean, why would I wake up so complaining? Mm. Um, God didn't hurt my knee; I did. Right. Um, right. right. <laughs> so you know, it, yeah, it's we just look at it and we go, okay, I can move around this. I can trust God. And so, Marty, what are some things that, okay, so when I'm thinking about the glance versus the gaze, and, um, you know, we, we even have a picture, I'm just going to lift this up, Frankie, I don't know how, how close we can get here on, on our YouTube, um, but it just gives you an idea if, if you're watching this on YouTube, and um, this is, find us on Spotify and, and Apple Podcasts as well, um, but when we're dealing with trauma, and we're dealing with core aspects that may have been damaged for years, you know, mm-hmm. like we're maybe just coming to more of a solution oriented approach. Mm-hmm. The, the glance I, I'm, I'm thinking might be more even natural to us. Cause that's kind of where our, our, you know, the neurons have fired. They've, they've told us to keep glancing. Mm-hmm. What are some things that help us 
to gaze, to, to lift our eyes back unto the Lord. Writing out answers in the workbook mm-hmm. will help you mm-hmm. because you fire neurons and you're creating new neural pathways. Mm. Writing out scripture will help you. In chapter two, I found working with many, many clients who had experienced severe trauma that I would say, okay, I want you to journal and identify your distorted thought. And then they had mm-hmm. the list of 10 and then replace it with a healthy thought. And the majority came back a week or so later and said, I can't think of a single healthy thought to mm. think. Mm. And so when I wrote this workbook, I put in pages of mm-hmm. scripture mm-hmm. that you can counter those negative thoughts with. So write out those scriptures. You're thinking um, the type of thought that's called emotional reasoning, mm-hmm. where you take, and we all do this sometimes. It's not like we're defective because we do it. Um, just like in science, there's a principle of entropy. Everything goes from order to disorder. Mm-hmm. So there is in our um, emotional mm. mind that so when when our thoughts are disordered then we need to apply second corinthians 10 5 take every thought mm. captive mm-hmm. and make it obedient mm-hmm. it's not like you know after you work through it mm-hmm. and look at every aspect of it then you might kind of consider mm-hmm. no mm. take every thought today yeah now this moment i love um, that yeah so so write it out though because then you're going to fire neurons and create new neural pathways so that becomes your go to thinking okay so so tell me why this why this worked so i'm i'm on page 23 and it says describe how tomorrow might be different and i'm thinking you know, maybe this is under the same banner. I don't know. Describe how tomorrow might be different from today if your thoughts about trauma are somehow transformed. So I wrote, I, I just, you know, tomorrow would be a day filled with happiness of heart, love. I, and I just, I wrote different things that um, for me would be different um, and just kind of like journaled them out. And then it was so helpful. Like I was like it's walking like... in victory and I was yeah. like, oh my goodness. Like I just, I guess maybe used like some holy imagination or whatever yes. vision casted yes. of what wrote it out. And then I started like, like actually walking in it. So what, what is that? What, what, where is that biblically anchored? Like what happened? What talk to me about that? Proverbs 23, seven, as a man thinks, mm. so is he. Okay. So you're thinking biblically, okay. you're thinking with transformation in mind. And, and the reason on day five of each week, I think, isn't that in day five of the first or the second week? Yeah. Day five mm-hmm. is called Imagine Transformation. Okay, and yeah. where I got that idea, I was treating a team of missionaries, and I'll, I'll be vague, um, they were somewhere in the Middle East, mm-hmm. and one of them wasn't with me. The rest of the team was with me in Boca in my office mm-hmm. because their team member had been gunned down and murdered mm-hmm. by Al-Qaeda. Mm-hmm. And so they were um, having counseling to overcome sure. the trauma of losing their sure. beloved. He was like a brother to them. And um, I asked one of the missionaries, as we're working on your core healing from your trauma, what do I need to add to the concept Mm -hmm. to help it be better? And he said, you've got to help people imagine transformation. Mm -hmm. And so that's thankful to someone who experienced a great tragedy. We have that each day. Wow. How cool. I'm I'm hearing two examples of both how this book came into existence and also this part mm-hmm. where God, he just, um, he brought beauty from ashes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I think that that, that seems to be some of the theme of mm-hmm. what actual core healing is, is doing is bringing beauty from the ashes yeah. of, of some of that trauma. Mm-hmm. So Marty, you know, as we, as we kind of close up and, you know, th- think about, um, some, some final thoughts here. So we've got a listening audience, some of who maybe remember a few episodes ago, when Amanda was on, some of who this is going to be potentially new material. Um, what what would be something that you would want to tell someone out there who's who has been struggling? They're stuck. Um, you know, this is a, a a broadcast. Good news for those who struggle. So it's like, you know, we're, maybe we're in the cul-de-sac that we've always been in. Do you have any words of encouragement? Um, they might be general. They might pertain to core healing. Like, mm-hmm. what what would you tell that listener that feels like? man, I I just haven't been able to get some of that forward movement. Okay. Well, the exciting thing um, in neuroscience, the research is showing that we 
don't need to be defined by trauma, even mm-hmm. really severe trauma, such as veterans of war experience. Mm-hmm. In fact, the military doesn't call it PTSD anymore, post-traumatic stress disorder. They call it post-traumatic stress. Because mm-hmm. why would we send people to war and then call them disordered? Mm-hmm when they experience trauma. Okay. Um, so what I would say to you listeners, um, and thank you for joining us, it's, mm. it's such a privilege to be with you, is that your trauma doesn't need to define you, but you do need to understand it when it ambushes you and manage it. And we haven't even talked about that. May I talk about that yes, briefly? Yes, please. Okay, so one of the most effective ways to manage trauma is through grounding. And basically, that's just being in the here and now. It's moving your mind and body back to the present. So there's three forms of grounding, physical, mental, and soothing. So one of the most important physical methods of grounding is breathing. You'll notice when you're stressed, when you're anxious, Mm -hmm. you're breathing up here. (gasps) Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is, it can be called belly breathing or biofeedback, but where you inhale through your nose, and inflate your lungs, and they're pretty long, Mm -hmm. so you inflate them, so let's try it, inhale, inflate, two, three, hold, two, so you don't hyperventilate, and then exhale through your mouth, (sighs) one more beat than you inhaled, okay, how does that feel? Great. Yeah, so in two seconds of doing that, you can consciously move yourself, and chapter one explains Mm -hmm. this from sympathetic dominance, which is your hot system that where you're not mm-hmm. breathing deeply, into their parasympathetic dominance, which is your cool system. Mm-hmm. And again, mm-hmm. chapter one explains that. But so physical grounding, breathing, and you know, that's biblical. Mm-hmm. The more neuroscience courses I take, the more I realize God told us this in the Bible. Love it. Like Proverbs, a heart at peace right. brings life right. to the body. What are we doing? Right. We're breathing. Yes. Uh, we're trusting God. Yes. So you can manage that and it won't feel like you can't. And that's the interesting thing, mm-hmm. why it feels so demonic to me when people are overwhelmed by their old trauma mm-hmm. and they just keep going there. They'll say, I'm so triggered. Well, destabilize the trigger and stabilize yourself. Mm right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can do it in just a 12th of a second. You can say, ah, I'm here. Like you can press your hands in the chair that you're sitting in, or if you're standing, press your feet in the Mm -hmm. floor, Mm -hmm. press your hands together. Here's a cool grounding method. I just learned not too long ago. It's been around a while, but you know, I'm always learning Mm -hmm. because the brain's neuroplastic. Yes. Yes. Whatever. Okay. So put your hands on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. And then with gentle pressure, just take them the length of your arm. Then put your hands together like you're washing your hands. We do a lot of that mm. now, right? Mm. Okay. Yeah. How does that feel? I mean, it felt good going down my arms. It was yeah, like, yeah. Oof, you know, back to back to some presence. Yeah, right? exactly. That's called havening, okay. like haven, be in a safe haven. And the amazing thing is it causes delta waves okay. to form in your brain, the relaxing ones. Mm-hmm. It also releases oxytocin, the mm-hmm. bonding hormone, especially in this time when we don't have as much touch. Mm-hmm. It's good. So now go back again, mm-hmm. and we're going to haven with a positive thought. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How do you feel now? I I even had some like um, I don't I don't know what you would call but like the uh, like tingles in my arm and just yeah, kind of like yeah. yeah. So you're telling your body it's okay. Yeah. You know and okay Psalm forty six one says God is our refuge and strength mm. a very present help mm-hmm. in trouble mm-hmm. so we feel troubled we remind ourselves God is my refuge and strength mm. a very present and help in trouble. Mm. So we have a problem. We say, thank you, God. I'll rejoice, not for the suffering, but in it, because you're going to teach me perseverance and proven character and hope. That's so good. And what I love about that is it takes it beyond uh, just a mental exercise where we might just try Mm -hmm. to get the the nearest verse we can. Yeah. But even even if we are memorizing a verse, if we do it in combination, like you just said, with the, with the haven or with mm-hmm. the breathing, right. it like engages us at a, at a much different, in a much different way mm-hmm. than yeah. just kind of like a mental exercise that leaves us maybe in the same spot. 
That's exactly. Right. So we combined with havening, we combined physical grounding and mm. soothing grounding. Then there's also mental grounding where, like one math teacher I know, when she runs, she um, grounds herself by saying multiplication tables. Mm-hmm. Now, for many people, that would not be relaxing. Right, right. But for her, it is. So, you know, some people say favorite sports teams yeah. in mental groundings mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. count backwards from 100 mm-hmm. by 5, so right. 95, 90. What you're doing is you're moving into your prefrontal cortex okay. where you think logically okay. and rationally. Right, right. That can happen in a 12th of a yeah. second. And when you're battling, uh, again, if I'm hearing you correctly, both your own flesh but also an enemy... Yeah. that wants to kill, steal, and destroy, for us to be able to come back to that place where we can hear the voice of the Spirit again, right? Yeah, and exactly. start thinking uh, like the, the divine truth that we know. Mm-hmm. That's huge, right? Yeah. Yeah, my goal throughout this workbook was to make it relevant and applicable. Like Chuck Swindoll says, mm-hmm. information without application leaves you in the same location. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And by the way, I wrote this so that someone who would never go see a counselor because they don't want to mm-hmm. or because it's expensive mm-hmm. can work through it on her own or wow. his own. So it, it's, each chapter is divided into five days. And if someone is experiencing severe suicidal ideation or something like that, I do say you need to see mm-hmm. a professional. Mm-hmm. I, I have some built-in things. Right. But what has been cool for me is to hear from people around the world saying, mm. hey, I got your workbook, and um, it's changing my life. <sighs> and that's only the Lord. Wow. Because when he brought me into trauma work, I knew nothing. Oh. And you know what it says to me about our God mm. is he really cares that you're experiencing pain Mm -hmm. he cares for the hurting people Mm -hmm. he said if someone hurts one of these children created in my image it'd be better for him if a millstone Mm -hmm. were put around his neck and he were thrown into the depths of the sea Mm -hmm. so i felt like i was the most unlikely person to Mm -hmm. be working in the trauma Mm -hmm. field and yet god loves to (laughs) yeah use the most unlikely weak people here we are here we are where i'm weak then i'm strong Mm -hmm. His strength is made perfect in each of us. Right. So core healing gives you a tool, and you can get it on Amazon if you want to, mm-hmm. and just work through it step by step at your own pace. Love that. So again, the the workbook's called Core Healing from Trauma, and it's by Marty Wibbles, and you, you can get this on Amazon. Is that mm-hmm. what you said? Yep. Great. Yep. Great. Well, Marty, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, not only being on the show, but also uh, taking uh, a new role in my life as I do oh. this work here and experience the, the healing oh. power of Jesus. And thank you, Casey. I, I know that's um, uh, for more than just myself at the Avenue Church mm. and, and in the church. So you and Alan are blessings. Thank mm. you for your generational blessings that will go uh, far beyond and continue throughout. So love wow. you and thank you. Love you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Good News. Uh, For those who struggle, uh, we'll be back next week, and hopefully this was a blessing to you. And uh, you guys just have a fantastic week. Much love to you all, and we'll see you next time.